Abraham. Abraham comes on the scene. So I want to start off with a question, open question, before we get into Abraham. If someone during this political situation comes to you and says, what right do you, Jewish people, have to this land of Israel? What would you answer? Just out of curiosity. I'm putting you on the spot, but it could happen. God gave it to us. We were there first. God gave it to us. Very nice. Why does you anyone know? else have a right to it over us? Um, like, you know, turn it back onto them. Yeah, that's a good answer. You could argue that Palestinians, some of them might have been there before we were there. You know, I'm sure they could come up with stuff to that. Is there? How about this? What else could we use to bolster? Anything else? We were there before Islam was a religion. Damn. Fighting words. Yes. Yes, that's true. I also like where you guys are going with it because most people, the average people, what do you think they would say? Someone who's just on the street, what would they, what would they answer? The United Nations recognized <laughs> Israel as a country in 1948 and 47 before that. And of course, we know the Balfour Declaration, things before that. Um, they would say militarily in a defensive war, the Jewish people won that battle. Pretty much how every nation started. America the United States of America, all, many countries around the world began because they won a war. Simple. That's all there's to it. And they lost. Um, historically, we've got archaeological records of all types of examples throughout history where we've been there. These are all valid answers you could give. International law, military, archaeology and history, all of it is good. But what you guys are touching on is what I want to get into tonight, which is all of that's great, but the only thing that can't really be disputed especially considering half the world is religious, believes in the Abrahamic tradition, it's like God, this week's Torah portion, tells Avram, it opens up, Lech lecha me'artzacha u'mimuladatecha mi'beis abicha el ha'aretz asherareka. Leave your birthplace, leave your household, and go to the land that I will show you, and to you and your descendants I will give this land. We didn't choose it. That's what God wants. The first verse of the entire Torah of Genesis says, Bereshit bar Lakim, in the beginning, God created. The sages ask a simple question. Why do we care? Why are we learning about the creation of the universe? It's interesting, but this is, a, this is a law book. This is a book of how to live as a Jew. Why do I need to know the beginning of time? And Rashi, who lived a thousand years ago, he answers a very interesting thing to say in the 1100s when there's not that many Jews in Israel. There were some, but like we've been exiled for a while. He said, if the nations of the world come and say, who are you to live in this land? It's not yours. We will point to this book and say the same one that said Bereshit bar Lakim, the same one that created reality, created the world, is the same one in the same book that says this is your land, and that's why it's our land. So we can get caught up in all the different explanations. We can get into all the arguments online, but sometimes I have fun. I just post that. I say, listen, God gave us this land. It's ours. You're going to have to deal with it. Like, but, but, and they don't really have anything to that. Always you can argue anything else. Okay. So what I want to do with you guys is I want to just read the um, the beginning of this week's Torah portion and a little bit further. And I want you to see if you can see any corollary to life and everything that's going on now. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick summary of this week's Torah portion. It's Lech Lecha. It's the third one in Genesis, which Lech Lecha means to go forth, to move, go. But actually Lech Lecha, anybody know what Lecha in Hebrew is? just means to, yours. to you, to you, to yours. Lech lecha means literally go within yourself. God is telling Abraham, journey inwardly. What's life about? Yes, it's an outward adventure. It's traveling, it's relationships, it's going on all these. But really life is about a personal journey of discovering of who you are. And God is saying they're intertwined. Your journey that I'm sending you upon is also going to be a journey within yourself to discover the greatness that is you. And when we read the Torah, we're not just reading about historical things that are happening. You're reading about your own life. Torah is, is eternal. It can apply all these stories about Jacob, Joseph, and his brother. It's all things that are happening in your life too. Reflected in a historical experience that actually happens, but they're archetypes. They are happening in your life all the time. So... This week's Torah portion starts, God speaks to Avram. It wasn't yet Avraham, it was just Avram. He got the letter added to his name later. And he says to leave, to go. And God, Avram leaves with his wife, Sarai, which later her name was changed to Sarah, to Sarah. And it's funny, because when my, when my parents moved from South Africa to America, she went to a class and this guy was saying, who knows the names of the parents of Jesus? So my mom's like, me? So now who knows the names of the parents of Moses? It's a hard one. So we'll get to that in a few weeks when he gets Moshe. 
Um, so knowing this stuff, sometimes a lot we don't know. So it's good to learn, learn about our history, learn about, so it was Abram and Sarai that they added a hey later and got their names changed. Sarah's brother is, anybody? This is like halfway up the Jeopardy line. This is like halfway hard. It's still hard Laban? though. No, it's Laban. Laban is later. Yeah. That's the Rebecca's yeah, uh, yeah. Lot. Lot, yeah, yeah. Lot. So Sarah's uh, brother Lot and Abram and Sarah, they, 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 they travel out towards Israel. Wasn't Lot the nephew of uh, Abram? He was the nephew of Abram and Sarah was related to him too. Sarah was Abram's um, niece. It's all connected back then. Um, so, so Lod is definitely going to play a pivotal role as we go forward. So they head down to Canaan. By the way, I had during COVID, there was a Black Lives Matter. There was a lot of arguments about are Jews are not the real Jews. We had, that, was, that was before the palace. We were dealing with something else. And I did a lot of research on this. And Judaism, did, you know, we were probably darker skin, but we were not black. The, the beginning of, it says in the Talmud, it was like boxwood. It was like a dark, it was like a brown. The, the first Jew, like you can imagine what Avram looked like, and he's not from Africa. Avram, the first Jew, undisputed first Jew, was from like Iraq, Mesopotamia. He was from that kind of Middle East region, which you could argue was like North, North, North Africa before now became, but just interesting. That's where Avram started, and he worked his way down and around to get to Israel, not North from Africa. He worked his way down. It's not to say I'm not sympathetic because all the artwork you see of Jesus and all these things are purely white. That's also not accurate. So I feel for, you know, African Americans like, where's our representation? For sure. So Avram builds an altar. He, thank, he thanks God for promising him the land of Israel. There's a famine, as often happens. There's a famine in Israel. No hummus. There's no food in Israel. So Avram, no sooner is he in Israel, he says, now we're going to go down to Egypt. And they go down to Egypt. Sarah is, you know, be interesting. Why don't we go all out? Um, Salome and what was her name again? Melissa. Melissa. Behind you, you'll see like eight or so blue chumashim right behind you in the middle. Can you try? And they're kind of heavy, but try and bring some. And and we'll uh, give them out. Not too much time, but let's let's just you know, let's do it right. Let's do like one for every two people. Then we'll have enough. Thank you, guys. And I might have to take one too for us too. So just make sure there's one left. Do you mind if we grab one and then, perfect. Okay, don't worry. We're not gonna spend too much on, on inside, but I just wanna show you. So go to page 100, uh, actually 90, let me see. Sorry, I keep directing. Okay, 70, sorry, page 70. All right. So if you look on 70, it says Avram goes to Canaan. And how old is Avram? What does it say on verse four? 75. He was 75. And you know how old he was when he died? Like 136 or something? It says he was 175. What's interesting oh, wow. is, the longer lifespan back then, what's interesting is, Anybody know the the numerology of Hebrew? Every letter is a number? Yeah. So once you get to Yud, it goes by tens. Yud is 10, Chaf is 20, Lamed is 30. So Lech, Lecha, Lamed, Chaf, Lamed, Chaf is 30, 20, 30, 20, which is 100. So the symbolism is that God was saying, you have 100 years now. 100 years now for this next stage of your journey. Lech, Lecha. It says, Avram took his wife, Sarah, and his nephew, Lot, and their possessions, and they went to Haran. If you look on the next page, 73, it says, God appeared to Avram. I will eventually, I will give this, just the bold part, I will give this land to your offspring. If you look down on the page, it says, Avram goes down to Egypt. There was a famine in the land. And look at the bottom of 11. It's uh, verse 11. As they approached Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, look, I know that you are, that you are a beautiful woman. Um, and the Egyptians, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me and allow you to live. So she pretends to be a sister and she's kidnapped. She's taken captive by the Egyptians. If you look on the next page on 75, it says, God struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues. Pharaoh understood that there was something amiss 
and he lets them go. Later in the Parsha, Lot is kidnapped as well, and Abram st starts a war, the war of the four kings versus the five kings. Anybody see any symbolism there with what's going on? With um, hostages. Exactly. Sarah and Lot are taken hostage. They're hit with plagues. Today's plagues might be bombs. But they're hit with plagues until they're forced to let them go. And they are let go. Wait, God willing, our caps will be let go too. Yeah? Okay. You said the Egyptians are hit with plagues? Pharaoh and his household, I believe. Let's look inside. Um, look on 17. God struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues. In the commentary, it says it was a skin disease that made being able to have a relationship with her impossible because God wanted to protect Sarah from her, from him. Um, and later, it says that Lot and Avram split paths. They, 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 they part ways with each other because Lot is not so moral. And his sheep and shepherds would allow the sheep to graze in land that was not theirs. And he's like, who cares anyways? It's going to be my land in the future. We own this. God promised it to us. Avram said he can't do that. He would muzzle his sheep uh, that they wouldn't eat in land that wasn't theirs. So Avram says, let's just part ways. I don't need your bad name around me. Maybe we've had businesses like that. We Let's just part ways. They part ways. And Lot goes to Sodom. Anybody heard of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah? And, and, uh, so this is where it comes from. If you look on um, page 79, we're going to quickly finish this Torah portion just outside. The War of the Kings. There's a war of the four kings versus the five kings. If you look on number nine, it says um, there are four kings against the five. Lot is captured. And it says Og, who was a giant, he came to tell Avram about it because he wanted Avram to go to war and die so he could marry his wife, Sarah. He had ulterior motives. Yeah. <laughs> they did not mess around back then. So it's interesting here. On page 81 on the top, and it shows you the map as well. 81 on the top, it says, When Avram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he armed, all it says, he armed 318 of his, of his servants to fight with him. But again, the numerology... Eliezer, his servant, is Gematria, is the number of 318. So some say it was just him and Eliezer versus everybody. Um, others say it was literally 318 of his soldiers, and they pursued the kings. I believe they were part of the four kings versus the five, and they won. But I, you know what I find interesting in this also, by the way, I, is that, you know, this week I've been doing, in two weeks, I've been doing a lot of, like, arguing for Israel, and I've been pretty tough. I, I post stuff, you know, you have to do what's needed, you got a stomach, you got to and a lot of people are like, how could a rabbi say that? How you're supposed to be peaceful? And I look back at the, and you could give me an identity crisis. I, I lead meditations. I'm very, I try to be a spiritual person. I, I realized a long time ago that spirituality is not holiness. It's not truth in and of itself. Gandhi, who's a pretty spiritual guy, told the Jews during the Holocaust not to fight back. He said, you ever heard that line? Only love can lead to peace. Oh, War leads to fighting leads to more war, and only uh, love can cure. Like something like that. It's not true. When you're dealing with evil. It's not like you give them a hug and that will cure. Unfortunately, the way that God, until we get back to a messianic state, it doesn't work that way. Those who are kind to their enemies will be evil to their friends. So Moshe sees an Egyptian beating the Jew, kills him. King David fights war after war. Avram saw his just his brother-in-law captive. A big big deal. You know, it's one person. He goes to war over that goes to war. So we see here in, in, you know, I've even seen quotes from other Jewish groups that are, you know, Torah doesn't have anything like that. No, there's plenty of examples of, of very tough. Now, granted, it's when God tells us to usually. It's not like, okay, God said it once in the Torah. So 2000 years later, I'm going to go to holy war. We don't have that. But we have many instances of fighting for our people and for our safety. Question of the other kings, they were in Israel or they were in Egyptian? Good question. Let's look at the map on page 81. Does it show where Sodom is? It says Dan. So you see all the way up in the north? Dan? Yeah. By Damascus. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. by the way, Jordan, which should be Palestine because Jordan is 80% Palestinian, the British carved it out. So they already have a Palestinian state. I don't know why we have to give a second and a third. Jordan was part of biblical Israel, so it's ours too. And north, where like Lebanon is, not all of Lebanon, but southern Lebanon is also. Mm -hmm. So... Don, where they fought up there in the top, that's where the war was going. I don't know if that's today's Israel. Um, Can I 
ask a question on what you said. Please. If most of Jordan is Palestinian, do they call themselves, they call themselves Jordanians, but... No, I think they identify, Jordan... they identify as Palestinians, I think. Oh, really? But the Jordanian king is known to be trifled with. He doesn't allow them to, like, do flags. And, no, you, you have to be... No, but they don't, have, they don't have citizenship. Isn't that what it is? Are they still refugees? Yeah, I'm not sure. They don't have yeah, they're still refugees. They're but that's refugees. also part of the reason why, like... And they'll never they're... give them citizenship, and they won't have to come back. The right like, of, that's what the whole it? right of return is. But, like, right. who's yeah. the original Jordanian... If... There yeah, aren't all yeah, these yeah, all these places are displaced yeah. Arabs from all over yeah. the place. There's no like there's really no historical historical yeah. like really Transjordanians or Palestinians, and there's no such thing as Palestinians. Right, but isn't there no such thing as Jordanians if we like created Jordan in like the 1940s? I don't think there's some ancient you know they call themselves the Hashemite Kingdom. Like I don't yeah. think Jordan like yeah. Egypt's got some history, but I don't think Jordan I have to look into it. Jordan I don't think there's. By the after, but the right. Hashemites are one of the tribes oh, there. Okay. And the, the British carved out a lot of independent countries at the same time as Israel, but only Israel is questioned as legitimate. But they're all it's around the same time. Um, just close off. It says, Avram, Hashem continues to give Avram the promise. This is a beautiful part here. Look at page 83, 15, where it says the promise of the offspring. So God turns to Hashem, God, to Avraham turns to God and basically says, if you look at verse 2, Avraham said, God, what can you give me? You're promising me the land. You're promising all this amazing things, but I'm childless. What's the point? What can you give me seeing that I'm childless and all I have is Eliezer? So I could give it to my student, but what about, and in verse 3, look, you've given me no children. At that moment, word of God came to him saying, this person will not be your heir. One born from your own flesh will inherit you. And verse 15, he says, he took him outside and he said, look towards the heavens and count the stars. If you can count them, this is how your descendants will be. And Avram believed in God. I'm just going the bold only. Avram believed in God and he counted it for him as an act of righteousness. And it says God, like really this trust that he had in him he, he gave to his descendants. It actually says that at one point, Avram, God lifted Avram above the stars. He said, you're an astrologer. Avram was a great mystic. And he said, I can see in the stars, I can see in the galaxy that I'm not able, me and my wife are not able to have children. God said, don't limit yourself by nature. You can go above and beyond nature. Your people will transcend nature. That's why Isaac, we'll talk about it next week. Isaac has a circumcision on the eighth day. Eight is higher than nature. Eight is infinite, is transcendent. It's the, it's the infinity on its side. The Jewish people are not limited by nature. And God was showing Avraham, even though it's true that in the galaxies and in astronomy and in the Mazalot and the constellations, you're not meant to have this, you can. You can transcend whatever nature has for you. I, I'm infinite. I can take you above nature. So God shows him above the stars and he says, you will have a, a descendants. And as the Parsha closes off, he does a covenant between the parts, like kind of a mystical, interesting thing, where if you, just to give you an example, like it's kind of trippy when you read it, it's like, what is going on here? He brings these seven different animals and then um, he places like on each side. And then if you look at like verse 11, it says vultures swooped down, but Avram drove them away. Like who cares? Uh, well, obviously there's something deeper going on. Number 12, as the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and he was overwhelmed by a dark and ominous dread. So what's going on, say the sages, is that Avram is the kind of the paradigm of like all that's going to come. Avram is getting kind of a feel of his descendants. Moshe did too. Why is Moses like later fighting God? Like, I don't want to go save the Jewish people. I'm not worthy. Because Moshe was saying, I know there's going to be more exile after this. Send Mashiach. I don't want to save them just to be back in it again. God said, this is your mission. You have to do it. So this, the stories we read don't make a lot of sense unless you zoom out and you see it in a bigger way. Avram's dread he's feeling is that exile is going to come to his people later on. He knows they're going to go down to Egypt, it says, for 400 years. And God says it to him straight up. Chap verse 13, God said to Avram, know for sure that your descendants will be foreigners in a land that is not theirs. And the people will enslave them and oppress them for 400 years. And when they leave that land, I will execute judgment upon the nation whom they will serve. And, and after that, they will leave with great wealth. And as for you, you will join your fathers in the peace. Okay. And then we close off the Torah portion with Ishmael. Ishmael is born because Sarah cannot have children yet. 
So she gives him her maid, Hagar. And Hagar has Yishmael. And now we have the situation that we're currently in. Well, <laughs> wait, wait, we're about, we're about to get to that. 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 So Sarah sees that Hagar is like being very egotistical in front of her. At least she felt that way. Like, I have a kid, you don't. Maybe I'm better for your husband than you are. And she has him, her kicked out. Sorry, I have a dumb question. Do Muslim people believe that they come from Ishmael? I, I'm, I believe they, like Arabs in general, I don't know if it's Islam, because Muhammad started Islam, but okay. I believe they, you know, most Arab, because Islam and Arabs are different, right? Sometimes it's the combo that's the they real think, <laughs> They think that in the Akedah, that yeah. it wasn't Yitzchak, that it was Esau in there. Ishmael. That it went Ishmael. through Ishmael's yeah. line, not yeah. through Isaac. They believe yeah. the Jews make it like so that. Is the Quran it? the same up until okay, that Tzchak, Well, no, it's a different character, and then it's a different story. I don't so, know. I didn't read the Quran. Qu Quran yeah. has a lot of the Torah. <laughs> Quran has a lot of the Torah in it, um, but uh, but uh, sure, they believe the, the channel through test, Ishmael and then the Muhammad. General yeah. test, but I don't know. Yeah. Is long. Muhammad a direct descendant of Ishmael? I'm not sure. Like a dude. Yeah, I think Muhammad. We'll do a class. We'll bring an imam. We'll do a proper, a proper. I didn't know I had to prepare the Quran for this class. I should come. I gotta come better prepared. I gotta come better prepared. Muhammad is real. Just go to the Palestinian rally. There's a dude. I think he's a real dude. Like a prophet. I mean, I think he's. Real. Uh, no, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, a, he's a, real a person. person. He's a person. Just like Jesus. Like, I By the way, yeah, he fought 85 battles and massacred Jewish towns, so they have sources for what they're doing. Um, but there's parts of the Quran that are peaceful. It just depends which part you're reading. So when they say it's a book of peace, part of it is, and then you get to the part where the Jews are hiding behind the tree. That's what it says. It's like, like Infidels or something. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like everyone, it's like everyone not just Jews. Not just Jews. Okay. Yeah. You don't believe Christians. In all. Yeah. So here's a fascinating part as we get to the end. Ishmael's about to die, and um, there's no water. And it's the Midrash says that the angels came to God and said, don't save him, he's going to afflict your people in the future. And God said, at this moment, he is not liable. At this moment, he is innocent, and therefore I will save him. So the angels were crying to God about what's going to come. They probably saw what was going to happen. And it says, God appeared to her and said, um, you know what? I read ahead. Hagar. Hagar was doing this whole thing when she was pregnant. She was acting this way and she got kicked out. And then an angel comes to her and says, you will have a son, Ishmael. But then they're kicked out later. Next week's Torah portion, they're kicked out again with when he's born. And that's when he's, that's when what I just said applies. But this is even before Ishmael's born. And they say you shall name Ishmael, which funny enough, Ishmael is the name of Jews too. Jews have used that name. It means God will listen. God will hear. And for all we know, at the end of their lives, Ishmael did tshuva. Ishmael allowed Isaac to bury Avram. He showed deference, showed respect. And says Ishmael and Hagar, both of them did tshuva and both of them were good. Um, but there was an in-between stage where he was, he was tough on Isaac. So it says when he was, uh, he, uh, Hagar, Ishmael's born, he's 13 years old, God comes to Avram and says to circumcise himself, to be able to have Isaac, to have this um, miraculous nation of the Jewish people, it is no, it's, you now have to take, go up another level. Circumcision, of course, being a proof of Judaism that you have to um, refine and uplift that which is most physical. And he's born. Um, some guys get cut at 13. No, that's it. That's Islam. Islam, I think, they, does they it. Get circumcised at thirteen? No, they do it. They do it at. I, I don't. No, no. I think it's. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I could be wrong. I'm not sure if Islam does it at thirteen, like Ishmael did. They might do it as a child, or maybe they do some little. Just Google it. Don't do Google images. Don't do Google images. Just video. Video. Not now, not now, not now. No, I, I gotta do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a little... <laughs> the current age is usually seven, although some Muslims are circumcised as early as the seventh day after birth and as late as the commencement of puberty. Thirteen. <laughs> All right. Done. They probably do it. Wait, they they probably do it on the seventh day. What's the difference between like? What? Oh. Oh well. Arabs are people from Arabia, from the, like the Middle East in general. They don't do Muslims. Arab Christians that are getting slaughtered left and right. Arab Christians exist. Then there are Muslims all over the world in Africa, in Indonesia. Indonesia is the most Muslims of any country in the world. What? Jewish Arabs, sure. Arab Muslims 
um, is the you know is is the majority of what 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 we what we uh, know of, and, and, and are dealing with um, having to deal with Jewish Arabs, Mizrahi Jews. Is that what you're referring Jewish, to? Yeah, yeah. Algeria. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And um, Isaac, Yitzchak, is born. God comes, um, and he changes their name. He adds a hate to Abraham's name and a yud to Sarah and a hate to Sarah's name, Abraham and Sarah. Deep idea there. I mean, if someone's ill, a lot of them choose to go to rabbis. They'll have their name, adding a second name to their name because your name is very much connected to your soul and to your life. So another name can actually change your blessing. So they have a hey added to their names, and then and of course Abraham had the Brit Milah. And now, um, and it says that Sarah was then like blessed to become youthful again, and she was able to have a child. And when she hears that, um, he, they both laugh. But it says Sarah laughed in like shock. And um, that's the name she gives Isaac. She says all will laugh at the amazing miracle of having a child now. Wasn't she at 100? She, she was 90 and Avram was 99. And, and we'll stop there. Now, what I wanted to do is, I didn't mean to do so long on the Parsha, but there's so many interesting things going on. And I'd love to hear your feedback after this class. If you'd like to do more on what we're going to do now, we're going to go deep into just one part as opposed to go. But I'd like to do an overview so you know everything in this Parsha. And um, I want us to look at, first of all, any questions, any thoughts on that, on that whole story? Anything? Good? They said she gave birth so old. In general, ages and, and all that stuff, look, we can read it how we want to read it. There is an idea that Moshe from that, like Moshe lived 100, 120 years in Judaism. You know, we bless you, you should live to 120. I think that's believable. Meaning if everything was perfect, if there was no health problems, if we ate right and we slept right, we lived in one of those, blue, was it green zone, blue zones? Mm, I think zone. I think 120 would be the, so I think that makes sense to me. Like that's not a crazy God. I mean, but when we read about 170, what? There's an idea that an ancient God limited age, but at that time, the belief is that you could live longer. There was a well, longer age gap. Didn't they, years weren't 365 days. Oh, maybe. Like they measured time. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe they yeah. used like yeah. the Hebrew numerics or something. Could be. I read somewhere that had to do with like people so getting hurt. Years. And that's why they were Yeah, could be as well. I have, was that? I have a question, like a general question. Men, yeah, humans are um, cursed. And there's a lot of cursed, they they were, like, you know, people like Abraham, a lot of the prophets, they, they, they have multiple wives. One second, one second, was it? What? You know, like Abraham, he had uh, Sarah and the other one. And, yeah. like, you know, obviously other uh, biblical people also had different wives. At what point did that become not acceptable in Judaism? Oh, multiple wives. Yeah. Um, like multiple, Boy, David, you're, multiple uh, side there, chicks. There's multiple side chicks. <laughs> oh, it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. Try to try to keep one wife happy. You know what I'm girls. saying. Um, <laughs> I think it's Rabbeinu Gershon. Um, there was a Takana. There was in in the 11 or 12 or 1300s. There was um, a big rabbi who outlawed it. Like that became like you could not do it from then on. Um, there are some groups that are still kind of open to it. Um, open to having more than one wife. Yeah. There are Did still some groups. That? There are, um, I don't know if it's a Yemenite or that still have the, the, the like from the times of Jacob. By the way, just, to, and this is a longer discussion. We can maybe continue yeah. another time. Even in biblical times, if you look at the majority of the greatest, they didn't have more than one. Mm. Isaac only had Rebecca. Um, Joseph only had one wife. Moshe only had one wife. The only exceptions, Yaakov mm -hmm. had more because he had to have the 12 tribes it was like yeah. a unique spiritual time where that's and Avram really only wanted to have Sarah it was only because Sarah said we can't have a child here's here's you mm -hmm. know so there's still I think within Torah the ideal and of course there was a king like King David or King Solomon but in general and that was King Solomon's downfall what about you? granted he had like a thousand but what <laughs> would you want to run? I don't think so I think so <laughs> I think um, I, I do believe in the soulmate concept and I do think um that uh, that that's that's the healthiest path, um, but teach their own. Um, so I just want to share one or two more thoughts, and then we'll, we'll do this. We'll break off into a little thing to, to talk. Uh, Avram is the first Jew. Why? How did he come to this belief system in the one God? 
Nobody believed in one God at the time. They believed in idols. They believed in many powers, magic, angels, like many do till today. Avram comes around, and he, he, there's many different midrashim. Some say that he saw the sun, and he said, wow, the sun is so powerful. I can't look at it without being blinded. It gives life to everything. That must be the most powerful being. At night, the sun goes away. Couldn't see anymore. The moon comes out. So maybe the moon is more powerful than the sun. It, it, it controls the, the, the waves of the ocean and whatever he knew at that time in science. Then the sun comes out again, and, it goes, and, and, and he sees the world around him, and he sees so much disparity and so much stuff, and he says, there must be one that's controlling all of this. The Midrash uses the example of a person, a traveler, who sees a palace in flames. And he says, there must be an owner to this palace, and the owner sticks his head out the window and greets him. That's the analogy he gives to what Avram did. He saw the world, he saw the chaos, he saw the good, he saw everything. He said, there must be someone controlling all of this. And when he did that, God spoke to him, and he spoke, revealed himself to Avram. And Avram is this rebel. He's an iconoclast. He's a revolutionary. It says his father, Terach, was a major figure in the time. And he owned, we know the famous story of maybe some of you have heard of it, he had an idol shop. And how Avram... He, how old was he when all this... Some say different... Some say he was older. Some say he was already like in his 40s. But as a child, it also says he was questioning. But he really took like force, like became who he was in his 40s. And it says that um, he destroyed all the idols in his father's shop and then he put the like the hammer or whatever in the hand of one of the idols and his father said who did this he said he did it this idol he said what are you talking about you couldn't do this and he said so you believe you believe you worship them but you don't believe that they could actually be alive and do anything and says so his father handed him over to nimrod to the king of the time and nimrod was going to have him killed and he threw him in a furnace flames and he wasn't touched and before that by the way he had two brothers and one brother said Avram's a fool, he's a rebel, kill him. The other brother said, let me, he didn't give an answer. He said, who are you with? He said, I'm gonna wait to see what happens to Avram. And when Avram survived it, he agreed with him and he got thrown in and he actually did not survive it. He had to have a, like a level of faith that Avram had and Avram survives and he runs away. And they say the name Hebrew. Do you know where the name Hebrew comes from? What is Hebrew in, in Hebrew? How do you say Hebrew? Hebrew. Ivrit or Ivri. Ivri comes from the word Aver, Aver Layam. It says that the other one or the other side. It says the whole world is on one side and Avram was on the other side. Everyone believed one way and Avram had to stand up and say, I believe in this way. And not only that, become a leader in that. That's something I think we can all think about for our time. Not just taking the non -pop unpopular opinion, but standing in that strongly. And there's a, there's a beautiful quote from... Um, I think it's in Thorstein Ver Verbal. He said, he was a big thinker in the early 1900s. He said, the Jew becomes a disturber of the intellectual peace, a wanderer in the intellectual's no man's land, seeking another place to rest further along the road, somewhere over the horizon. The Jew, by our nature, is to question, is to search for truth. If you look at all the major revolutionaries and thinkers, Einstein, Freud, Marx, good or bad, however you want to see it, Jews have always been searching and thinking of what is the right way, what is the path. We're never just sitting back. Okay. So I want to pass this out. This is just exploring one verse. The Torah is big. But every verse is laden with thousands of years of commentaries. So if you can turn to the people in your group and share these texts, it's four. We, we know in Torah that there's at least four levels of interpretation of every verse. Pshat, Remez, Drush, Sod, which stands for Pardes, paradise, or a lot of meanings to it. Pshat is a simple understanding of a verse. God told Avram, Lech Lecha, go to Israel. Simple. Told him to go, he went. Remez is hinting, Trush is allegory, so it is the secret. And then there's so so the secret within the secret, which is Hasidut. But there's levels to every word you're reading. So we're going to look at the first verse. God told Avram, go from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Just say, go to Israel. Mm -hmm. Go from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Choose how many commentaries, take turns, look at it, discuss it, flip the pages, only two and a half, 
three pages. I could have done more, but three. And we'll circle back. Just try and read a couple of them and do it in groups of at least, I think, three would be great. Well, when you say energy of the week, it's based on these themes, right? Like what was going right. What I like to do, like I think the meditation is just not flow with that. Is like to really think and feel into who I was. You know, like we took we learned about these people, like they were real humans that had to be around and we lived with people. I think they need to connect to them. I think that's what's missing. When we talk about leading the time, we talk about Mordechai and Esther, like feel into like who these people were and be them because they're all our ancestors. Um, but we'll get in the next semester on this concept for sure. Um, okay, so so follow the Torah and we'll see what he says. What does it mean left behind? It's a devotion of power. Israel going to exile twice. Left to left behind. There you go, you go, you go. You're in the middle. It can be bound or left behind. Okay. You can read it as left um, left. I mean, like, so God okay, killing Robert may have to go into two exiles. Uh, Those that occur from the first and second years. Alternatively, yeah, God hints yeah, that yeah, after 50, because the left is 50, which is after 50 generations, Aaron's yeah, yeah, descendants will be exiled in the days of his blood. Wow. it's a term is he's the he's the source of the Shulchan Aruch, and it's very practical. I love that, but he has a book on Kodesh, it's all the Marshall, a lot of stuff. The Baal Shem Tov said if he was, yeah, just like Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So you to walk with them in Park. Say hi That's awesome. So just you and him, or you go to class and get all the He's great. I used to talk to him a lot. He, he, he's a good, um, he's very out of the box. Yeah, he's big in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I have a sort of sitter here. We use Friday nights. Um, so why does it say leave your birthplace? Better to be in a place surrounded by lions than in a place surrounded by sinners. Are you still in the first one? Yeah, I should move to Scott and not stay in uh, America. Um, no, 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 I'm saying that this was needed to leave Abu Israel because it was the most place. Another place to get to the Abu Dhabi. Okay. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's is Rabbi Yosef Karo, who would speak to an angel. It's the whole book. The purpose of the soul descending to this world is to repair and to perfect the Nishab. The first time you incarnate, you merit Nefesh, a 
second time you're rough, the third time you're shadow. These three levels are hinted to in the verse from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house. So then what does it mean at the end? I will make you into a brand. Every person must reincarnate at least three times. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. I get it. The secret of the matter is that every person must reincarnate at least three times to receive that level of the nature of the matter. For like a plant that must be uprooted in order to be planted elsewhere, that is the way that it will grow. So too with men. The first time he comes to the world, he is not expert enough in heavenly or worldly matters. The second time he knows more. The third time he understands the matters of the world well and takes greater care in heavenly matters. When God says that from, from your land, it means from the land of the Nefesh, from your birthplace means from Ruach, and from your father's house is the Shema, because everything derives from the Father, and everything derives from the Shema. The three acts in the verse that I will make into a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great, correspond to the three and It's better to be there than to be in a place that's not. Now he gets a soap. The head of the heavenly academy of Shiva opened by saying, God said to Abraham, Get you, get, get out of your country. Because the light shone to him in this man. Since he has no merit in this place, let him go and take himself to another place and be worried. You need to leave something to go. The lock of what is kindled, the fire does not catch on, eliminate it. Let them splinter it into the fire. That's a ver that's something Tanya talks about about the body. Um, Skylar and, and you guys get. get uh, Get involved. Oh, yeah. Discuss it. What's going on? We're looking. I kind of like just going deep into the into the rest. Where are you at now? You know what I thought was a cool one was the bottom of the first page about the reincarnation. You see that one? Yeah. Page one at the bottom. Yeah. That each of us have at least three times we come back. This is not your first rodeo. Is that, is that like why people use it? It's Kabbalistically everyone. A lot of people don't learn that stuff, but yes. It's not a it's not a Hindu, it's a Jewish thing too. I never heard about Yeah. It's rare, but it could be. Most say, most mystics and sages say that um, that we definitely not our first time around. But there are a few. There are new souls like that. Oh, you're saying there are new souls? But it's it's rare. Yeah, it's not that we don't really believe that. No, there are. Like uh, they say, the Alter Rebbe was a neshama harash, he was a new soul. But it's not typical. No. It's usually no soul. Usually no soul. So has the population grow of the number of souls? Or what about another question? Connected to your question, how in the time of the resurrection of the dead, there's a belief that we'll all come back. If a soul's been in like five bodies, how does it come back? So they say it's like, uh, you know what, we'll talk about it as a group because I think we'll all, all talk about it. Well, also, we don't know about we can't qualify what souls are. It could be plants for all we know. It could be anything. Yep. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They say they can come back as, as animals, as, as uh, you know. No, no, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of religions, but it doesn't mean they own that idea. For example, when you think of a uh, Messiah, most people think of that as a Christian concept. Right. Super Jewish. So, because reincarnation is such a major play in the Eastern world, we kind of don't think about it Jesus. But it is, it is an idea for us. But by the way, it might be there might be nuances. Like when we say that a soul can come back in other things, it might not be like the whole soul. It could be like an aspect of it. Or, um, but it does say it's very painful for the soul to come back as a non-human. Because yeah. it doesn't feel like it can express itself properly. So, so I, I'm confused though. Like, we believe in Olam Haba, right? Yeah. Like, doesn't that conflict with Olam Haba? Mm. So when you come to Olam Haba, it's usually after the, the incarnation. So like, you know, or sometimes a soul can be in Olam Haba and needs to come back for something. So there's a whole a whole complex thing here. Sometimes it has to go through a few reincarnations to be worthy of Ganeden. Sometimes it is in Gan Eden and needs to come back. Like there's special people that were needed that have to come back. Sometimes your soul can connect to another soul to help you on your mission. Do you ever think about these things and just go like, I can't think about this, this is too wild. No, I love, I I love this stuff. I like this more than like, no, no, I'm a little crazy. No, I, most, I think most people are on your side on that one. It's a little bit out there. Okay, guys, can we, should we circle back? Give one more minute to finish off conversations. I want to look at the last page. I haven't looked at it. Um, that's the analogy I gave about the flames. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay. Um, how'd you guys... Good? Had some good conversations? Yes. 
So you can see how many layers there are to every single verse. I actually just want to quickly read on the last page. I want to read the bottom two. Um, Jody, can you get can you help me? I've been talking a lot. Can you read the second to last one by Rabbi Shalom Dover Blavovich from the time that God said to our father Avram? Yeah, I know my glasses, but you'll forgive me. Go from your land, and Abraham went on journeying southward. There began the process of... There's a hard Hebrew word. Birurim. Birurim. Of extracting the sparks of holiness that are scattered throughout the universe and buried within the material existence. So he says, what does it mean Avram went, journeyed southward? Southward is not just a physical going south. Going down, he was traveling down, means we, our soul, has to come down into the world to elevate the physical, to elevate these divine sparks that are trapped. Why did I make a blessing on the Diet Coke? It's to elevate whatever divine reality is in the physical world. Keep going. Sure. By the decree of divine providence, a person wanders about in his travels to those places where the sparks that are to be extracted by him await their redemption. Mm -hmm. The cause of all causes brings, that, brings about the many circumstances and pretexts that bring a person to those places where his personal mission in life is to be acted out. How powerful is that paragraph right there? Wow. God plans that you will wander in your life from town to town, from place to place, and be in certain circumstances because they're waiting for you. This energy is waiting for you specifically to fix it, to elevate. It could be waiting from the beginning of time for you to go and to elevate that person or that place. And it will cause, the cause of causes, God will affect that certain circumstances and pretexts will bring you to fulfill your personal mission in that place, New York City right now, clearly for each one of us, where you have to be at this moment in time, the people you're gonna interact with, the places you're gonna go, because the sparks are waiting for you to be elevated. And if you wanna get into Kabbalah, Kabbalah 101 is that at the beginning of time, there was a shattering of the vessels, there was a breakage of perfection, where a lot of wild, chaotic energy Divine energy was scattered, and our job is to slowly rectify that and bring it back to its rectified state. That's what tikkun olam actually means. Cleaning trash on the on on the beach is tikkun olam, but it's not really the full thing of what it is. Tikkun olam is 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 not fixing to put the trash on the floor in the first place. Oh, deep. <laughs> and <laughs> to fix to fix everything everything that's out of order. One more. Um, Comfortable? The last paragraph. This is the Hasidic masters explaining what does it mean these four things? Leave your land, leave your birthplace, leave your... And to understand this, by the way, you have to understand Hebrew a bit more, but it'll you'll see it in there. Do you want the parentheticals also? Yes. From Let's go all land, in. From your land, from your will. Now he explains in, in the parenthetical, what does it mean, why is your will connected to land in Hebrew? Go for it. Uh, Eretz, the Hebrew word for land is related to the word ratzon, desire. From your birthplace, from your emotional and behavioral self, which is the product of a person's environment, from your father's house, from your intellect. In the terminology of Kabbalah, the intellect is referred to as the father slash parent within a person, since it is the progenitor of an authority over his feelings and behavior patterns. So Avram's being told to leave all his limitations. You know, we're pretty comfortable in who we are, but are we open to going out of our comfort zone to try to look at life on a higher way? It's interesting because like, if you look at today's um, like psychologists, they'll say ancestral trauma is the hardest for people to break and that's why mm. we have these, these like spiral patterns. Wow. Can you imagine how much the Jewish people have? But yeah. I know. So I was thinking about Jews, if you relate to like the Holocaust and all of our... Mm. So he's saying, leave all that. You're not, you're not chained down by the way that your ancestors are. You're not chained down by yourself even. Leave your own personal... When we have a desire for something, we suddenly don't think we can conquer it. You can conquer... You have free choice for anything. You might say, well, I grew up in this environment. My parents were this way. I'm going to repeat the mistakes. It says you're able to leave it all. You can even leave your own intellect. I don't know if I should do this thing. Like, it's not really the right, like, I don't know if I'm worthy of this or doing that. It says, if your gut is telling you, maybe you should. You can leave it all for a higher calling. So 
This is just a taste into how far you can go down the rabbit hole of Torah study. Um, anything that you guys read that you want to chat about? You mentioned that right that second. Yes. I was thinking a lot about the dream question, and it kind of feels like a gut reaction in the morning. But the dream question you said? Yeah. The proverbial dream question, writing a question under a piece of paper. Oh, which yeah. is that? Is that in this yeah. second page? Yeah, bottom of the I second. I skipped that. Okay. The there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dream question. Do you want to just read what it says? Yeah, it also says an unread, an uninterpreted. So it says, before sleep, write a question on a piece of paper and put it under your pillow. Pray to God for an answer. When you wake up, first think about the question, and then you'll get your answer. So lech lecha, it says, could also mean go within yourself. Go into a part of your mind that's beyond your emotion into your mind. So yeah, so you're saying that... I guess I just want to know. More about it? I have not, I have not done it, but it is a thing. I've read about it in uh, different texts, um, and it's done. Basically, I think Judaism believes that God controls reality. So, so for divine providence to take place, you have to give a, a vessel for it, and you have to believe. So, like for example, a lot of Chabad people will do letters to the Rebbe. It's a book of letters that the Rebbe would write, Lubavitch Rebbe would write, and when they have a question. Should I go to this city? Should I, whatever. They'll write it down. They'll put it in the book and open to an answer. I've done it many times. Um, people in my family have done it. Every time I get an incredibly clear answer. Uh, so clear that I'm like, is this what he says in all of them? I flip like the next 10 or 20 and none of them would have made sense. But that one does. Um, and what is going on here? Is the book coming alive? I think Hashem is get, wants to give you guidance, signs, and you just have to give a vehicle for it. Maybe putting a question and praying and waking up and thinking about it and feeling a certain download, it's kind of like prayer. What's prayer? It's kind of emptying your ego and opening yourself up to the magic that of, of this, because we believe there's signals of, let me put it this way. Um, your soul is has clarity. Like it knows what you're meant to do. It knows what's right and wrong. It has a vision for you, all that. Problem is it's clouded over. It's clouded over by our anxious thoughts. It's clouded over by all the noise, all social media. It's clouded over by, some people never tap into it their whole life meditation, prayer, all these things are to help you just remove. You're not even doing anything. You're not going anywhere. You just have to remove the noise and then you get the downloads. Um, all the top musicians, all the author, they all say it was just like it just came to them. Just It wasn't like they thought really hard or they worked really hard on the guitar and then they like came out with that song. So yeah, I think with the with the dreams and stuff, it could be the same thing. Like, God, please, I want to have some clarity on it. And there are things we do. There are, like, prayers you can do when you have a bad dream, different things you can do. But, um, yeah, that's, I think, how Yosef, Joseph, was able to interpret the dream. Did he think about it? I think it just kind of, like, came through. Um, but, no, I've not tried the uh, paper, but maybe let's try it. I'll say this. Growing up, my family had this tradition. We were like in elementary school. Whenever we had a test coming up, we put like our notes for that class under the pillow and sleep on the pillow. <laughs> and, it seemed to work. and I wonder if it came from like wow. this interpretation. Wow. Wow. That's, That's like my Mexican maid saying she would light candles every Friday night in her family, even though she's Catholic, because probably she comes from like a Jewish family from the Inquisition. So they don't yeah. know why they do what they do, but it's rooted in like stuff. Yeah. I was in Southern Italy and this tour guide, I was just eavesdropping. She was by a synagogue and she said 15 to 20% of Southern Italians have Jewish ancestry. It just got hidden. You know how many Jews there actually are? Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. The Chinese and the Jews are as old as each other. We should be at billions. It's only because of persecution and scattering, but that also means there's a lot of those that were and had to hide it. So there could be 60 million, 70 million in Africa and all types of places. Yeah. Um, and how come with like 23 and me, it doesn't come out? more come out does, what actually. you're saying Ashkenaz. it does yeah, yeah. It does. People have like well ashkenazim sometimes they only go as far back as like a few hundred years so that's a problem but my mother's one is fardic she has a crazy 23 me it's like on that side of my family it's like italian sardinian um uh obviously algeria and france where she's from but there's a lot that we've side note if you haven't done it don't do it Oh yeah, we're well, like stealing sure. data. Yeah. Uh, or just yeah. lie about your yeah. yeah. data breach. You could just lie about your, lie about your info. Just change your numbers. I mean, my, my dad did it, so I'm. You know, You're good. It's good. You got, uh, that. You got <laughs> half. You got half. Um, I also think it's really cool on the bottom of the first page about the reincarnation. Do you guys see that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Bottom of page one, it says that the purpose of the soul we just explained was to is to repair your own soul too, not just the world around you, but yourself. 
What does that mean? I thought we didn't believe in reincarnation. So yeah, so we actually do. It's uh, in, 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 in practical Judaism, we don't usually talk about mystical stuff, but in Kabbalah, it's a known thing um, going back quite a ways that we do have reincarnation. Because things are part of other religions as well, we sometimes shy away from it. For example, we used to pray to the ground. Islam, Muhammad saw that. He's like, I like that. Islam is basically Judaism on steroids. Instead of fasting, <laughs> instead of fasting a couple times a, a, a year, they do a month. Instead of uh, praying three times a day, they do five. Instead of um, we would only in temple times as well as a couple times a year, like Yom Kippur, we would bow down to the ground. They do it every day. So a lot of the things get, and once they get taken by other religions, we like shy, we move away from it. But it is part of our tradition. Like so, dominating when you like move around a lot. Is like moving? Yeah, well, we some yeah. Jews will yeah. still bow to the ground like Muslims do. That was how wow. we used to pray. Um, it's done hiddenly. It's not done so. Pro uh, we do it only on Yom Kippur on Alenu, but that that was the way. And <laughs> reincarnation is a good example. Messiah, redemption. Jews are like scared to talk about Messiah because Jesus, Jesus and Christianity is a Jewish idea. And reincarnation, maybe it's not the exact same as they believe in it in Buddhism and Hinduism, but it is um, a, a tenet of Jewish like, belief. What I understand is like reincarnation is like if I'm good, I get reborn as like a person, and if I'm bad, I get reborn as like a cricket. Or in like, Judaism, in Judaism, Judaism yeah. or like in Judaism, is that like I get reborn as a person regardless? So, no, there is a concept so, as well of being of coming back not only in animal form but even in like plant life. Mm -hmm. But anybody see everything everywhere all at once or whatever? Mm -hmm. I, so I love rocks. when they're talking as rocks and stuff. Um, there is that idea, but it's also not so common. Like in general, it's the way you just said that you come okay. back as a person. And you just have to rectify it. By the way, when you have tests in your life, struggles, that could be the thing from a past life that you have to try this time around to like work on. So I was regressed once uh, a couple years ago, like hypnotized. Oh, wow. Regressed. Cool. Um, and in my past life, I was like a French artisan that got killed by a, a car accident. Wow. Um, and this is so a true story. Specific. I believe it. Um, oh, I I'll tell you why I believe it. Yeah, keep going. But, so I believe that I like that is a true story about myself yeah um and that's why I like when I went to France I was like oh my god I'm French um, <laughs> that's why we're attracted to certain countries certain quizzes certain things but past lives I didn't know I just like never I didn't know Judaism thought that way too yeah. yep it does but I think with what your example was we're like okay we are a good person you come back as a human you're a shit person you're a rat what is what is that's that? true yeah that's what they do keep going yeah, they but then like what how would you describe like the jewish way is it, is it more like your soul elevating and the soul has to c accomplish all the mitzvot it has to fix what it needs to do and if you don't do it in this lifetime it might return and then it can also be in a more elevated way like look at what it says here can, one second it says here not just oh i messed up i have to fix it it says you have levels to your soul you have to come back to reveal your own potential so in one lifetime you learned a bit you did a bit of good and you're fine you didn't do anything bad but you have to progress and sometimes you come back to go higher and higher and get your full experience yeah okay, okay so you mentioned that you come back and you struggle and, and that's maybe what you struggled the last time but if you come back reincarnated as a plant, you, you can't you can't rectify whatever you're you saying have. crazy. You don't have free will. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, it's gonna sound weird, but why not? Let's just say it. Okay. One of the traditions of always having fish, get filled to fish, salmon, having fish on Shabbat, it says that the righteous come back sometimes as the fish you eat on Shabbat to be elevated on Shabbat to finish their tikkun. What does that mean? They're righteous in a past life, but on Shabbat everything becomes elevated and higher, and there's some special thing that occurs I, I read that in one text um so i actually read something really cool it was, it was um it was that someone who is selfish or wicked or whatever sometimes will be reincarnated into a bee because the mother bee the main bee all the bees serve it like bees are selfless they're all trying to help mm -hmm. the center mm -hmm. and and that needed to happen to fix their selfishness in their life I don't know. I don't want to be a plant, though. What kind of plant? I don't want to be a plant. <laughs> I don't. I want to be like, if I come back, I want to be like a king Plants or a chill. Queen. But you're requesting what you're to chill. Yeah. Put it under your pillow tonight. When you're <laughs> By the way, the, 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 even if it's not a soul in the plant, the, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, he said he was once walking. It's a diary. The sixth Lubavitch has a diary. He says, I was walking in the forest with my father. It's beautifully written. And he says, I. I plucked a leaf off the tree and I just like crumbled it as we walked and talked and in the middle my father said how could you be so insensitive to just destroy something of this world for no reason um 
it was funny, I was sitting with a friend, we were planning next Shabbat, and we were sitting at, you know, I had a beer there, and this little, little tiny, little fly thing fell into it. It's like struggling, you know? So I went and I picked it up, lifted it up. I was probably pretty drunk at that point. Mm -hmm. I lifted it up and I put it down. First I told him, I said, I feel bad when that thing is hurt. How can Hamas see a baby? And like, like the level of like lack of sensitivity. But besides for that, there's an idea that everything, like the Arizal, I can't live this high. I'm not that. But the Arizal, who's one of the greatest Kabbalists of all time, he would never kill bugs. I don't kill bugs. I would kill a bug. If a mosquito or a, I, spiders, I can't handle. I'm sorry. But, but I do appreciate that sentiment, that idea that everything has its place in the world. Oh, I don't want to hear that stuff. I don't know. I'm arachnophobic. Um, yeah, I can. I'd rather have a lion in front of me. I like snakes too. Interesting. Also, those like lantern flies—they tell you to kill them. Okay, well that's. That's a little over the top. What are they doing? But what are they doing so bad? I don't know what they're doing so bad. People are very. They eat our plants. So they eat our plants. No, they're I don't eat vegetables anymore. They suck all the poison. Oh, they put poison in it? Okay, before we move on and conc and get into our final stages, anything else on in the papers that or anything you want to talk about on this? I have one question. Yes. So earlier we said how, about the years, the 175 years and the 100 years of um, Sarah and Isaac. Yes. A couple of days ago I was with my brother and we were talking about how the Jews were slaves in Egypt for like hundreds and hundreds of years. Yes. Do we count those hundreds and hundreds of years like the same way that like Isaac was 175 when he died so you're talking about the 400 years in Egypt that concept yeah, yeah so that's a very good question um because God tells Abraham to be 400 years but it wasn't 400 years so they say that from the moment Yitzhak is born they count from then because it is 400 years from his birth to when they leave Egypt but is it uh, like actually 400 yes. years yes so like if we think Sarah was 99 Bob Marley said it 400 years okay, uh, but if like Sarah was 99 when she had a baby yeah 90, yeah. Um, is, are like those parallel? Like if she's 90 when she's a baby, is it really 90 years as a slave? I know she's not a slave, but like... No, when he's born. That's when, when you start counting from. When who's born? Isaac. No, but we're... Isaac wasn't at the same time as... Oh, Isaac was parallel to the slaves in Egypt? From the time of Isaac's birth to when they left Egypt was 400 years. But then... 210 years. The Jewish people were in Egypt for 210 years. Judaism, then there weren't slaves in Egypt. Well, Isaac didn't mention Judaism, but there's, 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 um, there is a reason the sages give of why we could even do that to count from when he's born. So the idea that from the moment he's born and Abram has to like leave, leave, uh, leave Israel and is fighting with Israel, there's like a beginning of like an exile mentality, but only 210 years where they actually, by the way, one opinion is that you can't do that. Literally, they were in Egypt for 210 years only, and those 190 years have been part of the exile of history, meaning like it wasn't finished. Wait, what do you mean it wasn't finished? That slavery and exile in Egypt was followed by many more because the 400 years, it wasn't the full thing that God told Avram the Jewish people Wait, would have. I, don't, I, when I was discussing this yesterday, we uh -huh. didn't know that there were 400 years. Oh, okay. Like, we were just so what was the question? Like, is the, the hundreds of years that the Jews were slaves in yeah. Egypt, do we... Mm. Is it in reality 400 years? 210, okay. according to our, according, according to, to our Torah, Torah, Rashi's okay. math, based on when they were, when our Moshe was born, when they left, 210 years were in exile in Egypt, which we'll get into in Exodus. Um, and lots more to say on all of that. Uh, just to close off on Abraham, Kabbalistically, every one of the forefathers and mothers, uh, everyone represents a different one of the emotions and traits that we have. So Avram corresponds to, and you know? Tough. Chesed. What did you say? Chesed, yes. I said tough. Oh, you almost said it. So Chesed is kindness or love? Avram is the epitome of loving kindness. That's why he doesn't want, when Isaac, when God, when Sarah wants to kick out Ishmael, he says, no, no, no. Even if he's bad to Isaac, like, I don't want to, he just was love personified. He had his circumcision. He's sitting next week, we're going to read. He's sitting at his tent in 120 degree weather, trying to bring guests to give them something to eat, something to drink. Avram's whole life was focused on giving of kindness of, and by the way, that was passed down to both of his children. Ishmaelites, uh, uh, um, Arabs, it's, it's a known thing. Hospitality is their thing. Hospitality is like, because Avram was all about hospitality. He was all about, I remember when I was at Coachella a few years ago, we did a Shabbat tent. 
and I'm standing out there and I was like, oh, this is so new age, it's so different. No one's doing this at a music festival. And I was like, what do you mean? This is how Judaism started. Like Avram and Sarah were standing in front of a tent in the middle of the desert, uh, talking about wild ideas about this one infinite God giving free food, free drink out and giving shelter for people. Literally, that's how, and they were wild. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't like the way we think of a synagogue today. Judaism began in that way of these like searchers, these seekers that are going out to find truth and to share that with everyone around them, even though everyone was against them. It's very, very inspiring. You know, they say, if you could have lunch with anybody in history, who would it be? Avram's up there, very, very special human being. That clearly was because half the world is still following him. Half the world is following the Abrahamic faith and path. So he clearly was a, a revolutionary um, figure. It's your ancestor and somebody that um, we believe mystically is part of who you are. Your chesed, your ability to be loving and to be is all rooted in these the, the souls of these people. You could argue actually it's rooted in the divine imprint of creation and Avram was then personified it the most, but it was something precedes Avram, uh, of course. Right, can you pass me the instrument to your left? It should be a little black briefcase. Yeah, I, I was more of a crystal sample person, but I'm starting to, I'm starting to, to warm up to the uh, Shruti box. Is the box? Pandora's box. Um, Is the box? I usually prepare a meditation. However, I'm just going to flow. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Won't be long. But I think the goal, right? Why do we do in this? What, what, what's the, the belief is that we don't want to keep it intellectual. We want to connect ourselves to this wisdom. The Torah just gave us an idea of Avram. And it could be inspiring. But what can we, how can we bring what he stood for into our lives? Okay. So I want you to get comfortable in your seat. If you're not already. How old is that? I picked this up, it's about 2,000 years. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's new. It's just the instrument is probably from uh, Eastern lands. Probably got a lot of uh, history to it. It says that the, uh, the Levim, the Levites in the temple, were trained from a young age to play music for those who came into the temple. And they, they were trained to play it in a way that would evoke a certain inspiration and emotion. So when you went into the temple, it was like a real sensory, powerful musical experience. Why don't we do that anymore? We should, we will. Okay. We're coming back to it. You know, last night, Michaela Ezra was here. She said, you know, everyone hates us, wants to kill us for being, you know, Jews and all this. So we should be the best version of it. It's like people are writing like, you're trying to take a lock, so you're trying to take the temple mount. I'm like, now that you mention it, maybe we should, we should, we should take the temple. They're trying to tell us, you really want to do this. And she's like, no, no, we don't want to. No, no, you really want to do it. You want all of Israel. You want to. I'm like, yeah, actually, the truth is I do. And, but other Jews are like, no, we're going to give back Gaza and Judea and Samaria. I'm like, no. Yeah. So anyways, what I'm. What, um, when it comes to playing music, to, to connecting back to the ancient practices, I think we should look into it for sure. And Jordan and Lebanon. I like the way you're thinking. I like the way you're thinking. I mean, whatever was ours initially. That is the most like, beautiful strip, too. Like that there oil, there's no oil in Jordan and Lebanon, right? Saying, like, well, our, well, our historical biblical sites. No, I'm saying there's no, there's no oil in Jordan or Lebanon, right? It's crazy. Like, all the land. That we technically have. Well, Israel found oil, sure. There's oil in Israel? Yeah, they have found some. There's LNG. Really? There's no water. Yeah. Where? All right, we'll talk oil in a second. <laughs> I was like, like you were the only country that didn't have oil. I was like, there's a reason behind that. Ruined it. So I want to invite you to just close your eyes for a moment. It's a lot, pretty stressful, intense time we've been in. And I want 
want you to take a couple of deep breaths. So let's take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Let's take another deep breath in. Hold it for a moment. And out. You can allow your breath to go to its natural rhythm. Just notice how it comes in naturally. Your chest goes up and down, breath coming in and out. And just allow any tension that may be in your body to soften. It could be the muscles in your face. Unhinge your jaw, just relax your forehead and face. to go back to the times of Abraham and Sarah. Just imagine what it was like for them. To have this belief that everyone else disagrees with. To believe with all your heart in this truth. be so taken by it, so resonating with it in your gut that you nothing can get in your way. No danger, no ridicule. It's so clear and real by you that nothing else matters. Imagine what it must have been like to one day be sitting out in the desert night and to hear from the voice of God. And you know it's from God because it's something that you've never heard before that rings true throughout your body, through everything you know to be real. And that voice tells you to go on an adventure, on a journey, to leave everything behind, everything you know, all the people you know and all the places you know, and to go on a journey where you have no idea what's coming next. And you're given a choice. blue pill or the red pill? And you know your life will never be the same if you say yes to that call. But you also know you'll regret it for the rest of your life if you don't take it. Maybe think in your life now. Is there a path of 
truth that resonates with you that you might be resisting because it's challenging or difficult. And what if you knew the whole reason why you're on this earth is to follow that path? To stand up for what you believe in? In whatever unique way only you can? And knowing that God the Almighty is behind you every step of the way. Take a final moment now to connect to our forefather Abram and his wife Sarah to gain strength from their strength, from their love, from their courage, to know that you always have that within you. Take another final deep breath in and out. May Hashem shine his providence and give us guidance as he did to Avram and Sarah all those years ago on our own personal Lech Lecha journeys to our own promised lands. And may there be peace between Avram's two sons. your own pace you can stretch out your body a little bit your neck and shoulders and whenever you're ready you can slowly open your eyes welcome back <laughs> gotta play, play around with these keys a little bit had live music planned for now but there was something that came up so i will have them next week um thank you all for coming out anything on your minds as we conclude from either the meditation if anybody want to share anything that you thought about or the class anything you want to take with you or struck a chord of any kind about avram's life or about anything we spoke about or not Yes. It just popped in my head. What could it have been at the time that gave them the strength to get through those challenges that they faced? Like, mm. you know, we have everything nowadays. Like, we can turn to our phones, or some may pray, or talk to friends, family, go to their therapist. But what could it have been that they had? It seems like the greats 
um, Yosef, who was alone in the pit. And think about Joseph. He lost his mother as a, as a child. He was, brothers hated him, thrown into, he was framed, thrown into a prison. Um, Abraham was alone. Uh, he had his wife. Um, Moses, like, ran away from the palace. King David, they built themselves up. They had God. They were very connected and in tune with their spiritual source. They were on a journey, a lone seeking journey. And I think when you go really far in that way and you realize that Hashem is your partner and you're, you're, you've are you got so much inside of you and those two things together, um, you become a very, uh, you, need, you need support from the community, from friends, etc. cetera. But um, there, and especially if you have good parenting when you when you start you're giving you that base but it's something i think that um they were just incredible humans that were able to access the greatness of who they were because we have inside of us so much so like just getting to know your own soul and your own who you are is a lifelong journey and the like more you of reflection and yes yeah yeah i mean avraham is some say is the source he is the uh, of the book we have over there safer yitzira safer yitzira is the, one of the greatest books of Kabbalah of all time. He was a master, you know, mind and and spiritually he was speaking to God. I mean, he was somebody that didn't need people around him to tell him, no, you should do this, do that. He was in touch with, with truth. He's a visionary. Um, but I think each of us can do that a little bit. We should have, we shouldn't think we know everything. We should, but at least for my personal life, I've been on journey, on my own journey. I haven't like followed other people's journeys. And I think at some point you got to ask yourself like, Am I just following what is laid out for me and being the way that TV and everything's telling me to be? Or am I thinking for myself and choosing my own path? And that own path is a blend of your friends and of the best advice you've heard and mentors. And But ultimately, it's yours. Carve your own path. Yes, yes. That's what Avram teaches us, for sure. Um, and clearly, the person, the soul chosen to be such a leader is, is, a, is a not the normal human. I mean, he's somebody that was, if you were to meet him now, I mean, he would shine the whole room, which he was somebody that was, um, but what I do like about these things is also humanizing and seeing like, where can I see that? They weren't like, it's not like they didn't have ordeals or challenges, um, <coughs> but, but definitely they were on another level entirely. Um, yeah. Two announcements. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Well, I don't know. I think everyone has to choose for themselves. But there is a rally tomorrow at 12 at uh, Washington Square Park for NYU and, and other students. Um, yeah, we each have to decide what is our Avram, what is our... And next week we'll go into, or maybe the week after, will be the life of Sarah. So we'll go more into his wife, Sarah, which to me is equally inspiring. Um, in a way, on a higher level than Avram ever was, uh, which we can get into. But, yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um,